Yeah, I know last week, I mean, it was good because then I, you know, don't get distracted, which is kind of yeah. nice. <laughs> All right. So I think we are live. So let's just confirm that. Okay. Let's just take a look here. Yes, we are live. So I'm just going to take a quick moment and welcome everybody to Strong as a Mother. My name is Stacy Urig, and I'm going to be your host for this episode. For those of you who are not familiar with Strong as a Mother, this is a series that I put together in March at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic to really highlight for people perspective. You know, I think when the pandemic started, everybody was really freaking out, you know, understandably so. And there was so much emotion and so much worry wrapped up in the uncertainty and the unpredictability of this pandemic. But what I knew for sure was that people have been harder than this. People have been through things that are harder than this pandemic. And so it encouraged me and inspired me to find other people with stories that could inspire other people to look at the challenge that they're going through right now with the pandemic through a different lens. And so I've had a lot of different people on here. I'll put a link in the comments to the album where you can find all of the recordings. Um, but most recently I was in touch with Tanya Hawkinson, who's my guest today. Tanya came to me because she lost her child to suicide in September of this year. So for those of you that are going through the pandemic and you're really upset about so much of the inconvenience that this pandemic has brought into your life, I want to remind people that life is still happening. And we all know that. We all know that life is still happening. But so many people are in struggle. And this particular struggle is such a challenging one because it is shrouded in secrecy. It is surrounded by stigma. We're talking about mental health challenges. We're talking about drug addiction and family members, specifically in Tanya's son, and ultimately his passing from suicide. Tanya came to me because she was seeking to stop the stigma on all of these kind of taboo topics. And I give her so much credit because it is such difficult stuff to cover. There's so much shame often associated with all of the things that we're discussing. And I appreciate her honesty because she knows that shame cannot live in secrecy. It just can't. Um, last week was our first episode of this four part series in which Tanya shared with us some early warning signs that in retrospect she sees um, through a different lens now that she's lost her son. And today's topic is going to be a little bit more challenging. We're going to be talking about her journey loving Ryan through addiction. And I really want to phrase that very specifically because I don't want to say dealing with. When you have a child or a family member who has had a substance abuse issue, you are loving them the whole way through. And that love is so painful because it is absolutely encapsulated with fear and worry 24 7. <laughs> yes. 24 7. And so I was so grateful to Tanya for approaching me and asking me to provide this platform to her so she can share her story so she can break the silence on this topic that nobody wants to talk about. But I know that there's somebody that's watching this that is probably going through a similar journey to what Tanya's already gone through. And so if her story can inspire you to reach out and get help, that's the goal. So I'm introducing Tanya. I'm coming to you live from New Jersey. I'm 30 miles outside of New York City. Tanya is joining us from Washington State, a few hours outside of Seattle. Tanya, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Stacey. I really appreciate doing you doing this with me because um, I really, like you said, talking about it is the only way to stop this. Mm -hmm. Like stop the stigma, stop the shame, stop hiding it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm gonna back up and say in 2013, um, my mom passed um, and Ryan was very close to her. 
Uh, they loved watching baseball together. I mean, he said his first swear word because she would always say shit when she watched baseball with him. So they were very close to, you know, and um, when she passed, um, it was a shift in him. Uh, and typically people don't know how to handle grief. I mean, through the masses, we just don't. Um, we know more today than we have in a long time, but watching him go through that is when we first noticed the shift in him. Um, he was suspended from school and that was the first red flag for us. Uh, he got caught um, with pills in his backpack uh, and <clears throat> had stolen a master key for all of the lockers at school. So uh, it was huge. I mean, it doesn't seem huge in the moment, but that's a huge thing. Um, so we did our best with that to discipline and direct, right? Um, and all was good for a while. Um, I mean, it was maybe like eight months later or so um, that we started seeing signs. And I don't mean signs that are glaring, okay? So our son's drug of choice at first was pills, um, Oxycontin specifically, which as everybody knows is a hugely addictive drug, okay? Um, and what happens is when you can no longer get them because they're expensive, people shift to heroin, which became his drug of choice. Uh, so during that eight months when we thought everything was good, he was going to school, he was passing, not amazingly because he always hated school, <laughs> Uh, but was at least getting by. Um, Anya, how old was he? Um, about 13 or 14. Um, and the things that we noticed first um, were little things like the aluminum foil would be missing. Uh, spoons would be disappearing from the drawer and we had no idea where they were. Uh, like we would find mechanical pencils that were taken apart or pens, ink pens that were taken apart because they used those as straws. <laughs> so they melt down the heroin to, to inject it or they crush it up, snort it. So those were the little things that we started seeing and we had no idea what it was. You know, it took us a while to figure that out. What and, was your thoughts when those things went missing? Did you just think it was super strange? Yeah, I mean, basically you're like, what the hell, why? You know, um, and you don't really, at, when you're in the moment sometimes, you don't really question it as much as you should because you can't explain it. <laughs> so sometimes you just kind of, whoop, okay, that was weird. Let's just move forward. Right. Did so it ever of, occur to you that there was anything drug-related involved? No. I mean, yeah. no. The only inclination at first was the pills that he got busted with in his backpack. Right. And so, you know, time had passed. He was doing okay. And then you start seeing signs, you know. Um, and this went on for several years, you know. Um, and then his sister started noticing stuff. He started failing in school again. Uh, you know, uh, he would come home and literally sit on the couch and pass out right in front of you while you were talking. That was huge. We both were like, okay, this is not good. <laughs> this is not good. Uh, and we tried to get him help several times. What did that look um, like, Tanya? Oh, well, he uh, basically started stealing stuff from us. So we would have jewelry missing. We would have um, cash missing out of our wallets. Um, you know, just in general, things that just you couldn't explain and they would be missing or gone, you know? And you're like, okay, well, did I lose it? Like, you literally think you're losing your mind <laughs> because you're like, I swear to God, this is where I put it. And then you can't find it and you don't know where it is. Right. Um, and 
when he got to a really low point and he did go to um, a facility, uh, they only put them in there for 30 days. Um, and our insurance at the time did not cover this. Now, let me tell you, this stuff is so expensive to put them in. So when you have someone with addiction and you love them to death, right? That's basically what happens. You love them so much that you're blinded by what is happening and you look past a lot of stuff. Um, and I know um, when you don't have insurance, not everybody can afford to fork out 10 or $12,000 to throw them in a facility for 30 days. Um, so a lot of people don't get help. They don't get treatment because they can't. There's just no way they can do it. Um, and so, you know, he went in the facility the first time and came out and was doing pretty good. But one of the biggest things that we learned through this is when they get done, which let me back up just a tiny bit, 30 days isn't enough. <laughs> and how old was he the first time he went into a facility? Uh, uh, 16, okay. I think. Um, don't quote me on that, but still. yeah. Um, and you, 30 days isn't enough, okay? <laughs> like you can stop the addiction, stop the using in 30 days, but you can't stop this, the mind game. Now Why can we hold to that? that? Cause I think it's so important. And this is why last week we talked a little bit about the early warning signs. We talked a lot last mm -hmm. week about attention deficit disorder and some things that went un unknown, like unknowingly. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned last week, you know, <laughs> Tanya and I are experts in life. We're not experts, we're not medical experts, we're not, we're just experts yeah. on the things that we've experienced in our own life, right? So we can't yeah. tell you this is like medical or professional advice or that all people who exactly. have A are gonna go down this particular path. But what you were just saying is such a poignant thing, which is in so many cases, someone learns to stop the behavior, mm -hmm. but if you don't get to the core root, yep. It doesn't um, change. Then it cannot change. Yep. Yep. And so were you guys aware of that going into treatment? No, we, mm. I, I had never really dealt with um, addiction on this level. I mean, I've had family members that were addicted, but they're removed a little. So it's mm -hmm. not, it's not your immediate own life. Right. And so you, don't really delve into um, what that looks like. So, you know, we went through the first round of treatment and it was great for like maybe a month or so after. Um, and the, the one of the biggest problems that we discovered is every time you go through a treatment, right? And you get clean and you pop right back into the environment and the place that you lived before, mm -hmm. nothing changes. You're going right back to where you were. So it, they call it your triggers. Um, so your environment, the people that you're around, if none of that changes, the, the, uh, the percentage of people that go back to using after being put back into their same environment is extremely high. And do they because, tell you that going into rehab? No. No, this is all research that I found on my own and dealing with him um, going through a few rounds of this and going to Naranon meetings, reading books, talking to a therapist, um, learning so much more about it than we ever knew. You this know? is why this, it, I hate to say it this way, but this is why this painful experience for you is such a gift to other people. Because there is someone right now out there that is struggling with their child or a sibling or a spouse, some yep. sort of loved one, where they're at that point where they can yep. get them to go to rehab or whatever the case is. The information that you're sharing right now is invaluable because 
all of that stuff, we need to understand how to help this person succeed through this yep. huge struggle. And yep. the fact that you don't know that going in is such a huge disservice. And so yep. I'm sorry that your pain is having so much purpose, but it does have so much purpose to be able to it help does. other people. You know, and that's for years, I know you and I kind of touched on it, but for years, uh, we didn't talk about it to pretty much anybody. Just, you know, he's a troubled teen, he's struggling in school. We didn't really tell people what was happening. And why was because, that? Um, looking back, you know, you can always see better through hindsight, right? Um, looking back, I think a lot of it was we were um, blaming ourselves because maybe maybe we screwed up maybe we weren't a good parent maybe we could have done this maybe we could have done that um and also um i think a lot of shame you know like we didn't want to be judged we didn't want people to look at him badly you know and come to find out when we finally did open up about it um i mean like my my job at the time did not know for probably a year and a half um and I missed a lot of work that couldn't be explained um, because I didn't want to tell them. And when I finally opened up about that, they were like, um, I wish you would have told us sooner. Like, dude, you do what you need to do for him. They were, I got to tell you, like, I've never had bosses or an employer that was that cool. Um, basically, if I had to leave, to go search for him because we thought he might be dead under a bush. Uh, you know, they were like, you go, come back tomorrow. We'll see you then, you know? Um, so having somebody that understood was an eye opener for me because then I was more willing to talk about it. And that's one of the things like, if somebody, if somebody comes to you and opens up about something like this, don't judge don't put any shame or blame on them. Listen and try to understand, even if it's just a basic understanding, because that literally opened my heart and my doors to be able to talk about it more. And I want to just point out for people that are watching, because that is, I think, the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you see it in death sometimes. I've heard so many people say, I lost this friend or I lost that friend during a grieving process because they very often people don't know how to respond and so they just bail out, right? Yeah. yeah. So one thing I would recommend to people who are watching this, maybe you have a family member or a friend that's going through what Tanya's describing as far as being the parent and you don't know how to help them. Mm -hmm. If someone opens up to you in any kind of struggle and you don't know how to help them, so your initial reaction is to bow out, here's a suggestion. A suggestion is to simply say, I hear you and I hear the pain. I don't know what that feels like. And I actually don't even know how to help. But what I can do is I can walk right next to you through this mm -hmm. complete shitstorm. And I will learn with you and I will be there to hold your hand. I can't say I'm going to be able to do it well, but I will not leave your side. Sometimes yeah. we just need that one person that we can go to with, like, just like you said, yeah. no judgment. Yep. yep. My husband and I were talking about this, Tanya, earlier this morning. We were talking about this interview and I said, I was so proud of you for being so forthright because there always is so much stigma and so much judgment. And, yeah. you know, it's just such a shame that people are not willing to look at all of this like any other disability or disorder. Mm -hmm. Addiction is a true disability. It's a true disorder. Yeah. And the fact that you cannot share it with other people for fear of judgment would be like yeah. my dad who just had open heart bypass surgery on Friday, not being able to tell people he was going in to have his heart right. work done. Yeah, exactly. So uh, 
if if you were watching this and and you don't know what to do to support someone, just be there. Just be there just because be there. it's it's huge. You know, Tanya, uh, how many times did Ryan go through rehab? Four. And how many times did Ryan overdose? Oh God, I don't even know the true answer to that. Um, because when you like, I feel looking back, I feel terrible for my other kids, especially our other daughter, um, that lived with us still for a while when he was going through some of this, because it's really hard on them too, you know, because they see all of that. Um, but he overdosed, um, three times that we know of. Um, and probably several more that we don't know about when we finally had to kick him out and tell him he could not come home. Um, that is an experience, let me tell you, as a parent, <laughs> that is, you basically just put your son in a grave. That's how you feel. They are dead. They're living, but who they are is now dead. And that is one of the toughest things that you have to do is that cut off in separation because it's the only way they really can see you love them, but they have to help themselves. And that's a very difficult thing. Yeah. And now what, what got you to that point, Tanya? Um, it was probably, so let's see. It was probably four and a half years ago, five years ago, I think. Um, and he, you know, had stolen some stuff from us and uh, was trying to sell it <laughs> uh, on Facebook. <laughs> and he neglected to block us from those posts. <laughs> so, um, caught him and then he agreed to come home and go to rehab once again. And he was staying at our house that night. And our daughter was there with her family um, in transition from moving from one house to the next. So she was there with her family. And I had literally not slept in about three days. Um, and I was sitting on the couch with him because I didn't want to leave him alone. Um, and <clears throat> I went to bed for a couple hours and she went to the bathroom and he walked out the back door and she came running upstairs and she's like, Ryan took off. So I went running down the street after him, um, caught up with him. And I said, Ryan, if you leave this time, you can't come home. Like, that's it. You were going to go to rehab tomorrow in the morning. But if you walk away now, you cannot come home until you get help. And he turned around and looked at me and it was not him. Mm. Like for real, you could, he was not even there. He was like, I gotta go. And that's what the addiction does to them. It shuts off all of that. And they look at you with dead eyes, basically is what I called it. And he was gone. And I literally, grieved for about three or four days because at that point I knew there was nothing more I could do. We'd done everything we could and it was up to him. I want to talk about that and take a glass of water <laughs> or a cup of coffee, yeah, my coffee. <laughs> whatever you need. Cause I know this is, I, I've had this conversation with you off camera. Like I don't want this to be trauma triggering at all. It is not for me. Okay. I mean, I know people watching, it may be a trigger for them. And, you know, just just be aware. Take a deep breath, okay? Yeah. Because um, I know it's hard. I want to talk about something that you mentioned before. And this is actually what my husband and I were talking about earlier today. I told him how you had shared with me that you're on all of these different groups of mm -hmm. um, other parents who have lost their child to suicide and that there is a lot of shame and a lot of guilt in those yeah. groups felt yeah. by the parents. And you had said something to me that was so wise. And it was that 
you knew at one moment that you you literally had done everything you could but yep. that you were not responsible for ryan's decisions yep. and that he was a human being with his own motivations and his own thoughts and his own life and you were there to guide but when you realized you couldn't guide him anymore you I don't want to use the word accepted, but you you got to that point. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because I think that it's really important if somebody is watching this that is going through this to hear from you. And this is when I say really loving your child through this experience. You're not yeah. giving up. Yep. You're 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 actually loving them enough to let them walk. Can yeah. you talk about that? Yeah, it um it literally I just saw Teresa's comment. She's like the hardest thing to do ever. And yeah, it is. Um it literally rips your heart out because that's your baby, right? Um, and you're looking at them through a mom's eyes. <laughs> and you see them still, this little tiny thing that is yours, and you're in charge of this. But as you already said, they are people with their own minds, their own decisions. You can't control that. And you try as a parent to control that a lot. And you cannot. <laughs> um, so when he got to that point and I finally was like, you gotta go, I can't do this. We had already been seeing a therapist we had been um, attending Naranon meetings, reading books about, you know, loving and letting go. <laughs> because when you keep trying to control and hold on to them, they realize that no matter what happens, you're going to be there and you're going to save them. So they know that no matter what they do over here, you're still going to be there to rescue them. And when you put the onus on them to say, it's now up to you, I can't help you anymore. Like, it's up to you. It changes everything about what they do. And around what age was Ryan when that happened? Uh, he was... God, I want to say 21... What was the say, after effect of that? How long was it until you saw him again? Oh, it was a while. Um, he still had his cell phone, um, which, you know, I was able to check in with him now and then, but still not, you know, it was several months after that. Um, and he came home for Christmas. Um, and, you know, he was not looking well, you know, and all of the other kids were there and they saw the same thing. They were like, oh, he does not look good. And I'm like, I know. I mean, like we can just love him and he has to make that choice. But that's the part where as a parent or even as someone that loves somebody that is going through addiction, the point of being able to put the responsibility on them for their choices is key the sooner you can get to that point, the sooner it will <clears throat> benefit them. Because then they know that you are not going to be there to pay for them to get out of jail, to put them in rehab. It has to be their choice. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, I think, one of the hardest parts and the hardest steps in all of it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's rough. Yes. So I want to recap a little bit about what you've shared. The first thing you shared a little bit about were some of the very early signs that you mm -hmm. had no idea were early warning signs. Yeah. A bright kid failing school, mm -hmm. getting suspended. I want to point out that, you know, um, the stealing of the key to the lockers or the finding the pills up to that point, that was not Ryan's MO. Mm -mm. That was no. a red flag. Yeah. 
right? Yep. Um, certain things missing that you did not correlate to possible drug mm -hmm. use, aluminum, spoons, mechanical mm -hmm. pencils. Yep. Right? I think all of this is so important. We're trying to give people a roadmap and also a better understanding. So if you have a friend that's going through this with their child, you can support them without judgment. Yep. Because I can, I, one thing that we did, you know, that really sticks with me through a lot of this is when you have a child that has addiction, let me tell you, you can come from the best families or the worst families. It doesn't matter your background or how you've raised your child. It's still ultimately, it's not your choice. That's one of the things that you see a lot of parents struggle with is the shame and the blame that it's their fault. Mm -hmm. And I want people to know that it is not, okay. Yes, maybe you could see some signs and try to get them help sooner. But beyond that, it's their choice. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the key things that you really need to, like, I want people to know it is not all on you. <laughs> My last question I have for you is, did Ryan have a good way of being able to share with you why he used drugs in the first place? Um, we always were able to talk um, better than most um, that he's he was around. Um, and when he went through his rehab, I think it was the third time, I can't remember. Um, and I asked him why he kept choosing to go back to it. Um, and he said, because it makes me forget. And what do you think he was trying to forget? Um, I asked him that. He said, he said everything. He said, life is just hard, mom. And it makes me just forget all of the bad things and all of the things that I think are to come because he would always think forward. Well, I'm going to have to move out. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to do this. He would get so wrapped up in worrying about what he might have to do or things like that that it would stress him out so bad and that's where the mental illness comes in did you find ryan as a young child easily stressed out yeah i guess um he always wanted to be perfect when he and played sports out that that doesn't necessarily get modeled at home either no you know i have two children who are adopted and um, one of them, I've always said to my husband, we're going to have to keep an eye on because he doesn't want to make a mistake. Yeah. yeah. Right. And yep. if anybody knows me, they know, like, I'm all about making mistakes. Like, that's <laughs> what the lessons are. Right. And, yeah. and when you can identify that, that maybe is another thing to talk about as a warning sign of and you hear it often I'll, I'll hear it from friends even today with high schoolers like i don't know where they get it from like yeah. i wasn't like this i'm not pushing this they're so stressed out that they're not getting all a's they're so stressed out that this isn't perfect and i think social media adds a whole other layer yeah. that perfectionism yes, on um you know i want people to understand it doesn't necessarily come from the way someone's being raised there are just some children who inherently have this intense need for perfection yep. and um, i don't want anybody to judge anybody if they see that they have a child that's dealing with that i think too often they're like oh well they must have learned that from home or Mm -hmm. Their parents must be forcing them to feel that way. Right. I think it's really important that people understand that's not necessarily the case. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I, it, that's, he was so smart, you know, and then the whole shift in their brain, which, you know, we talked about last week, you know, 
it totally changes everything about them, you know? Yes, and, and very separate and very different, but I'm going to bring it up because I'm trying to use this platform for awareness and to look at everything from all angles. Though he is much better now, when my son had his concussion, he did a 180. Yeah, We did not recognize him personality-wise, and he did not recognize himself. Yeah. And we were able to help shift that. We did a lot of therapies, a lot of mm -hmm. different work to try to get his brain back to where it was prior to the concussion. Mm -hmm. But changes in the brain can cause huge personality shifts. I saw it with my stepmother when she had her dementia. She was yeah. a completely different person. Yeah. Um, and mental illness and mental health issues can cause that. And we need to understand that without fear of being judged. Yeah. And so often people will turn to drugs so they don't have to be scared of themselves or feel that pain. Yep. And it's so important that people recognize that people who, who end up down a path of drug abuse, you know, you were asking, you used the word, I didn't want to use it before you asked Ryan why he chose to do it. I'm careful about using that word mm -hmm. because sometimes I don't know that it's necessarily a choice. Sometimes it's almost more like a compulsion, but that's mm -hmm. again, a brain chemistry function. Yep. And that's, that's exactly why 30 days is not enough. It's not enough. You know, to me, 90 days is not enough. Right. You, you need a good six months. And the so problem you, with that is that, we don't live in a society that mm, the majority of people can afford that kind of service yeah. and it's not yeah. covered by insurance. Yep. I and do have to say insurances are getting better. Mm -hmm. At least ours did um, because they totally did a whole flip and therapy was, is now covered a hundred percent. Mental health issues are covered at like, 80 or 90 percent on our insurance so they've done a complete shift in the last few years which is a huge step in the right direction <laughs> you know i mean of course we wish that it would have happened sooner but it didn't so that's why that's why i choose to speak about it you can get help if you can't find somebody that can point you in the right direction Mm -hmm. because there are places that can help yeah and it's getting better just one yep. step at a time we have work to do yes <clears throat> as we wrap this up what do you want people to walk away with knowing everything that you've just shared and everything that you learned through this part of the journey um I'm, the biggest thing for me is when they're younger like our son, um, be aware of those signs and get them help quickly. Because the sooner you can get them help, therapy or meds, and find out really what is happening inside, the better off it will be. Mm -hmm. That's just my personal opinion. Not everybody's going to be that way. But the younger you can catch them, with issues like that um, and figure out really truly what it is and not just brush it off, it may change your life. Right. Yeah. And to that end, it did change your life. And Very that's going to be our next episode, which I don't think is next week because we've got Christmas, Christmas. Eve next week. Yes. I'm going to take a pass next week. We'll be back the following week. Yes. And we will be talking about another incredibly heavy, challenging topic, which is actually the event in yes. which Ryan took his life. Yes. And I, again, just give you a tremendous amount of credit, Tanya, for coming forward and talking about it. You are, you're going to save a life. That's what I hope. I'm confident of it. 
and that's why I do what I do. And that's why you're doing what you do. And we as humans are all connected. We're all responsible for each other. And if what we're doing can help save one life. Worth it. Right. I love you. I love you too, lady. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay.